Okay, now we're live with our Migrant Women Reality Watch once again. Um, I am actually replacing Adriana, who is our communication officer and um, member of uh, or facilitator in the Radical Girls. She was supposed to do this interview initially. And uh, I have as our guests today, two wonderful women, Salome, who is uh, in the middle, and she is our most loved co-president of the network and also the founder of two organizations, um, Akidwa and Wizesha, and she can tell us more about them. And also we have with us Malaika Oringo, who is based in the Netherlands, and uh, she's also a founder of an organization called uh, Footprint to Freedom, and she'll also tell us about this. Uh, but the general subject of today's uh, discussion, we're continuing the conversation that the Radical Girls started um, not the last week, uh, pr the previous week about discrimination and violence uh, and injustice that uh, women of African descent, uh, in, in particular black African women face in Europe, but also globally. So this is the subject that we will focus on today. I'm going to pass the floor first to Salome and then to Malaika. If you can introduce yourself, tell us about your work, where you are, who you are, and where you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and it's a pleasure really to talk to some of the members of Venom and everybody who is listening. My name is Salome Mbugwa and I live in Ireland. I'm originally from Kenya, uh, which is in East Africa, and I've been here since 1994 now in Ireland. Um, in uh, 2001, but it was prior to that, 1999, um, I drew my own isolation and experiences of racism. I started mobilizing women, uh, and that's how we formed our organization, Akidwa, the Migrant Women's Network in Ireland. At first, it was a support group, but now it's a recognized uh, organization with credibility, and we work with migrant women from all over the world. You know, we have people from all the continents in our, in our membership. Akido was first an African women's network because some of the issues we felt could not fit very well by bringing everybody. And so um, in 2008, uh, through the influence of the funder and dictation of the funder, we ended up actually opening the network to everybody. So we work on a range of issues. We work on gender-based violence, which is key major in our work. Our work there is mainly on uh, female genital mutilation. Um, then domestic violence, and we are currently actually uh, researching on trafficking of African women um, in Ireland, uh, and, but really looking at it globally. Uh, and we will do that report soon. We also work on health, and in health, we work on mental health. Uh, we just produced a report in January there uh, called Let's Talk, which is actually migrant women or mental health the needs of migrant women uh, in Ireland. We work on um, integration. Integration is broad in itself, but we mainly focus on uh, a project called Le 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 um, Brain Gain, which is actually looking at uh, migrant entrepreneurs and professionals in Ireland. We also used to work on, a, on, a, on an employment called, uh, project called um, door, the, just the door, the, on the door, to, to help women to get entrance into the labor market. So that is Akido, actually. Then I have another organization called Wezesha, which is actually the Africa diaspora-led uh, uh, network, uh, where we actually really working just with Africans and trying to strengthen the positions and situations of Africans in Ireland, but in Europe in general. And as you can see, you know, we have had a lot of uh, issues going on uh, with the Black um, Matters movement. So um, our, our that organization on um, Africans is very, very important for us because we didn't want to uh, align uh, our organization with the declarations that we have, but mm -hmm. also the Durban declaration on people of African descent. So that's just the introduction I have. I'm also a commissioner for Irish human rights. I was appointed by the president of Ireland after going through the process of application. So it was competent enough. And um, after, you know, there were over 60 people who applied for that job and I, I got actually appointed uh, as a, a commissioner. So I work also as a commissioner and I'm just in my final year finishing my doctorate. Um, 
I've finished it anyway, so it's just waiting for uh, to see what happens now with the examination and all those kind of things. So that's me in a nutshell. This is a very big nutshell. <laughs> okay, Malaika, tell us about you. Yeah, after hearing from Solome, I have uh, a lot of work to do, uh, but thanks for representing us. Um, my name is Mar Malaika Ringo. I'm a Ugandan. I live in Holland for the last 15 years. I am a founder of Footprint to Freedom. It's a survivor-led organization for victims and survivors of human trafficking. The term survivor-led, it means that it's organized and managed by survivors of human trafficking. Um, I've realized after working in the anti-human trafficking field for the last 15 years that there have been a lot of gaps in helping um, survivors and victims in a culture-centered manner, like in an African mentality. And I realized that uh, in order for us to serve the victims and uh, survivors' rights, we need to give them a voice and a place to share their narrative in a culture-centered manner, but also in the way they need to be served. Um, so what we do with uh, uh, Footprint to Freedom, apparently I am the CEO and I'm running it myself for now. I do not have bit uh, I have the board, uh, but I'm in the, um, the period of recruiting other survivors who want to take the lead. So what we do is that uh, we inspire and empower survivors to advocate, to become leaders, to take the front line in the fight against human trafficking, but also to be as role models for other survivors that um, there's, life at the, there's life at the end of the tunnel. I mean, we share uh, coping strategies and other means and techniques and uh, giving skills on how to, to move from uh, the traumatic experience to self-sufficiency. Uh, as I said, I've been working for the last 15 years. Uh, what I did mention that I'm also a survivor of human trafficking. I, I started in the industry of uh, um, human trafficking prevention. Um, as a victim trying to, to raise awareness about human trafficking. And um, I've been working as a, a victim advocate, but also a speaker on anti-human trafficking. I work with Salvation Army, EU Affairs, on uh, different issues, on uh, helping with coming up with the right campaigns about human uh, trafficking. Uh, the women voice when it comes to human trafficking, especially the non-documented migrants, but also, um, on a community level, I work with uh, schools, communities, and um, parents, uh, sensitizing them about human trafficking. Apparently, I'm uh, on the journey of starting up uh, an East African Advisory Council, which is led by survivors of human trafficking, uh, to be able to share their views uh, on anti-human trafficking and be present at every decision-making table from the grassroots community to the state level. Uh, in this way, uh, we're going to be able to uh, to implement policies that really speak the language of survivors or that are relatable, because what we see nowadays is that uh, there's a big, a big gap between the existing laws and services that are given to the survivors and victims of human trafficking. Yeah, that's where I am at. Wow. I am a mother. Also, You're I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. She's yeah, she just made 10. So we're three mothers here. <laughs> well, um, this is all very inspiring. And uh, both, I think you both uh, built, or in case of Malaika, a bit in the process of building your organization from the lived experience. And Salome started from this, um, introducing her organization, saying that uh, how she she started Akidwa. <clears throat> of course, we know it in the network, but maybe not everybody else knows it. And I would like to I would like to ask both of you um, about the, concretely the discrimination, the the, the violence, the, the oppression that African women face in Europe, there are, of course, we all understand that we, as, as migrant women, we, we face different types of discrimination. It all depends uh, also on your economic status and your family status and your language, and there are so many other factors. But there is something cross-cutting that would be um, for the black women. 
and I want you to speak concretely is from your lived experience and from your organizations as well. Um, what, what are those problems? Salome, you can start, or, or Malaika, mm -hmm. whoever prefer, yeah. Yeah, just to say that, you know, the problems are so many, Anna. Like I said at the beginning, Akido started as a migrant women's network, which was actually the African women. So it was only African women. And with this, you know, you could see the burden. And I spoke about actually racism and how um, women were treated with suspicions, for example, from the very beginning. They were seen as a threat. You know, they would take men from an uh, Irish, uh, Irish community. But apart from that, they were seen as a threat in terms of, uh, um, you know, the way, you know, you move around and the way you do your things. There, were also, there was also a lot of exploitation and many people wanted to take advantage or still want to take advantage of uh, uh, African women. Um, and when we talk about, uh, you know, the discrimination that African women face, you know, because again, when we talk about African women, we are not a homogeneous group. We come from 54 countries, I want to tell people that. And within those countries, there are ethnic tribes and ethnic groups, you know, so it can become very, very complicated. We could be actually coming from Kenya, but you come from very different uh, um, background. And so the way we perceive, for example, domestic violence or domestic abuse is very, very different, even within our own communities. Uh, but then it depends on how the services are provided for people to be able to access those services. And uh, one of the key major challenges that we had, for example, from the, from the beginning uh, was uh, actually women in, in, in my, from my own organization trying to access help. And that was in terms of maternity hospital. When I came to Ireland, I was young, so we were all in our own reproductive stage where women were getting children. And so they had that experience of going uh, to the maternity. And mm -hmm. some women would be neglected, you know, they wouldn't even be listened to, that they are pretending, or other people will be served and they are not served. It's still the same, you know, because people are really, the attitudes of stereotypes and prejudice is still so much there. And dis discrimination is very, very wide. So it's very, very uh, difficult for many African women that I work with uh, to be accepted the way they are without uh, being actually undermined or looked down upon. Uh, there's also a lot of discrimination when we come to the accessing of employment. Uh, yeah. We did, our, for example, our first research on African women to the Irish labor market where we had very educated women. Even myself, I had done social work in Kenya, but here I couldn't even go back to social work or get to know how I should go back. I either had to go back and do the whole, um, you know, training, I had to train as a social worker before I can get a job. So even up to now, up to today, three weeks ago, there was a report that was launched. And in that report, it showed very, very well with people of African descent and in particular women. And then it goes even into de details when you are a woman of faith, if you are having hijab and other things that you experience even more in-depth kind of a problem. So, you know, accessing services, accessing jobs, um, accessing anything that people want to access, you know, because they're treated with suspicion. And even women going through their application for international protection, sometimes yeah. you know, they're they are, they are not actually trusted, even when they say that they have gone through um, gender-specific harm. Sometimes they are asked to justify, like how can you justify uh, a form of sexual um, gender-based violence, including female genital mutilation that we work on, uh, of which some women do go for ex examining, and they are examined, and they are seeing actually whether they have experienced that. Also, poverty levels are major among uh, African women, and this is because they are not able to access jobs that uh, can help them to live a meaningful life. So you would find that, you know, most of them are not able to get out to meet the needs of their family or the mental health have impacted on them and it have affected them very poorly. So for now, maybe I, I leave there and I leave Marika to also tell us, yeah? Yeah, I, I can uh, relate 100% uh, on the uh, discrimination experiences you're talking about. Um, maybe I'll speak on, on uh, the direct discrimination as a person. Um, I, I realize in the, yeah, when we're trying to assimilate or integrate in the society, uh, what I had to experience, I know most, most migrants, women experience that, or migrant people in general, is that the question that I asked as an introduction, instead of asking, uh, who are you as a person or what are your aspirations? They ask you, how did you come here? Did you come in, in the boat? Um, um, when are you going back? Um, 
also I realized that we are all, like you mentioned, we come from 54 countries and we all have different uh, narratives. We are the same, but we have different needs. But it seems that we are categorized as one group. It's like every black migrant is a refugee. Like you, you need to be a, a refugee or related to uh, having been abused or a victim of human trafficking, something like that. So that is on a personal level that uh, you are not seen for who you are, but for who they think, they perceive what is a black migrant woman should be. And also secondly, I realized that after graduating, I had a problem at, uh, um, getting a job. So after trying for some time, I, had, I was directed to um, an employment coach uh, who sat with me and said, you know, Malika, um, you are highly qualified, I understand, but you're not going to get a job because um, you're, okay, she didn't say it like that, but in general, my skin color does not match with my credentials. Um, I've got an accent, uh, a Dutch, when speaking Dutch. So she suggested that I should look for a job that most black people get job, but that is uh, helping older people. Mm -hmm. And I re I, it's, it's a, a way that how here migrant women enter in the employment industry. They just go in, in, in one arena that is in um, helping older people and um, a bit of social work, but because of the language and the accent, they really do not get uh, um, jobs that suit their desires. Um, I think 70% of the girls we graduated with hunted jobs for over one year and they gave up and they ended up working with uh, factories, uh, fabric, like in industry work, like mm -hmm. manual labor. Uh, so it's very, very hard to access uh, labor as a, a migrant uh, uh, woman. But also I realized that um, there's limited recognition of what we do as migrant women in the societies. Um, I've seen women who have really anchored in uh, developmental work, helping uh, the elderly or cleaning up the, 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 the community and small initiative, but there's no platform that is given uh, or achievement, a recognition for such people. What happens is that the young generation of our children cannot identify with us because we look, we look like um, a generation that are not really attractive members in the society. So they rather associate with the, with the, with the white race. So this lack of recognition is, is making it very hard because we really have to work very hard to be validated or actually do a hundred times more than uh, the other people. But with, when it comes to my work, uh, I see that uh, most of my clients are facing what they call structural discrimination. And this is the worst form of, of discrimination because, um, well, it's not legal. It looks normal that they're doing things unconsciously and it makes it, yeah, they carry on business as usual. For example, uh, children from parents who are coming from migrant origin, um, they always end up in schools uh, that are preschools like because their Dutch is not perfect or something like that. But it's very hard for them to move from that section to get into the mainstream. But also uh, with the women who are in asylum centers, they are not uh, allowed by law to go to school. Mm -hmm. I've met a client who has been uh, in the camp for 25 years and now she's 45 years. I can imagine by the time she'll get papers, she's not, uh, she has lost the grip on how to really be um, a contributor to the economy. Mm -hmm. And also when it comes to healthcare, especially uh, for non-documented victims of human trafficking, because once you lose your uh, residence permit, then your rights are withdrawn actually. So which means you lose a right to go to school, a right to health, a, a right to housing and you depend on the church and non-government organizations to, to help you. But so, what- uh, sorry, Malaika, you mean, uh, in this case, you become undocumented, right? This is when you- yes. mm -hmm. Just to clarify. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, just to make it clear, most of uh, the victims of human trafficking get temporal permits as, uh, because your, your victimhood is attached to touch, uh, getting the person who trafficked 
traffic to you. But as we know, it's very difficult. This traffic has come with so, in so many faces and use a lot of techniques. It's very difficult to point out that John he lives on street ABC is my traffic. Mm -hmm. So there's always kind of um, uh, a wall between the truth and the truth is in with the traffickers. So most of the time, they cannot bring their traffickers forward for so many reasons. For example, the Nigerians are under a voodoo contract, whereby if you mention that this, this woman uh, or this man trafficked me, your parents have to die or something is going to happen to your family. There are so many reasons why they cannot point out their traffickers. And because of this, um, they find themselves undocumented and when you're undocumented, you are stateless. You're not out, you are not in. Mm -hmm. So you cannot access a lot of things. But in healthcare, because these are women who have been on the street and struggle to strive and they have been re-trafficked, they leave. <sighs> yeah, it's very hard even how to, to bring it out. That they've been rescued and brought to the rescue, after two years of not catching the traffickers, they are thrown back on the street. And these women have to sell their bodies illegally just for survive, to survive. Mm -hmm. So they end up going back to uh, being trafficked. Mm -hmm. But because they don't have enough resources um, with these limited funds that are there, I've met a client who had been having toothache for four years. If anybody has ever had a toothache, and you have to carry it for four years because you cannot go to the hospital. It's very painful. But also things like um, if they want to have abortion or um, when they want to go to the doctor, um, they say when we explain to the doctor, it seems they're not hearing us. It's like we either under diagnosed or uh, not taken uh, serious. So with this indirect uh, discrimination, it makes it very hard to solve because it's really embedded in the policy. If you are undocumented, then you don't have a right to be ABCD. Mm -hmm. And then us as advocates for this, it's very difficult to step in to help this person because she doesn't have a right anyway, legally. Mm -hmm. So those are the forms of uh, discrimination, uh, me as a person and as an organization from my client's view, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, actually, this subject of health access, access to health services and care is, is very important. It's cross-cutting among our membership, different ethnic groups, but it's, it's quite clear that the women of um, um, African descent, the, and I know specifically for Ireland, but it will be the case in other countries, they consistently score among the, the groups with the least access to uh, health services. And especially when it comes to maternity care and the quali quality maternity care. And we have also a lot of obstetric violence uh, and um, uh, basically the women are not able to receive the care that 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 is required when you are becoming a mother. I know uh, that your organization worked on this, right? Yeah, okay. I wanted to give an example, a very quick example of an incident that happened of uh, a woman, you know, it, she was a, an African woman who went into a maternity hospital, but uh, the, the, the child was uh, was dead, you know, in the womb. So she wanted uh, to be helped for the, for the child to be taken, you know, and to save her life. And so when she was taken to the hospital, because that time the abortion was not legalized here, but it could be it could happen in an emergency situation. Her name was Bimbo. Um, and they they refused. Why I'm bringing this story? Because it's because it brought the whole issue of, um, you know, th there was less in it. And there was actually a mention of things that related to because you're from this background. That's why you are being treated like this. And so the woman actually went home and then came back because she was in so much pain. And the husband accompanied her to the hospital. And throughout the, the time, you know, the woman was in severe pain. She was screaming and she was calling for help. And the nurses said that she was pretending that this is how African people behave. This is how they scream. And actually, she ended up dying. She died in their hands. And it was quite unfortunate. So it, it's really very, very sad because, you know, the whole issue of cultural competency is not taken into account. The whole issue of saving the life of somebody that could have been saved uh, didn't happen that way. My organization asked for corona um, inquest, you know, to be, to be carried out, of mm -hmm. which happened. 
but then it was uh, um, ended up it was actually declared as a, a, a case of uh, misadventure you know so it wasn't like even put like it was anything so it's very very challenging and many women have lost their children as well in the hospital and what they look for it to be told sorry because you see from the culture again from the african culture uh, I generalize the continent here now. Many people, if you lose something, you are told sorry, but many of them are not even explained what happened and what should have actually happened. And so many people as well have been assumed when they are trying to access the services. You know, we've had women who would be told to use the pain, you know, the pain, the, the, the taking away of the pain, like epidural. I don't know whether countries yeah, yeah, use yeah. epidural. But many African women have, you know, misconception, not you no know, misunderstanding of those, don't understand them. So you have been told to take something that you don't know, uh, you've never used before, your people have never used it before, you, you, from your background, you've never even heard about it, and now here you've been presented to use. Mm -hmm. And then they are left even when they're in so much pain, being told that, you know, that it's their fault because they didn't take painkiller they don't understand it that way so there are a lot of issues and in particular uh, for African women they find it very very difficult to navigate the health system mm -hmm. and what is your experience Malaika in terms of access to health care not you personally but the women that you work with um, I can speak for myself and the rest but um, the same instance that you've talked about happened to my friend uh, she was pregnant um, she went to the hospital uh, and of course I escorted her saying, she said, I did not hear the kid move for, for the whole day. And um, they chased us from, uh, from the beginning that it's not yet time. Maybe the kid is, is, is relaxing. You need to be patient. But nobody looked into her concern. We went home and then the next day she said, well, uh, I really need to, to hear my child heart move like a heartbeat. We went back to the hospital and then they checked they couldn't hear the heart. And then um, it's after three days they realized that the baby died in the womb. But in between this process, we were going and calling, actually, you know, you just can't show up. First, you have to make an appointment. And that phone call uh, back and forth makes it very difficult for you to uh, to access the medical care. They ask you questions, how are you feeling and stuff like that. So she really um, lost the child. And then um, she was um, given some uh, sedation that she has to uh, push out the baby, the, ba the baby by, by herself. But after that time, what really missed was the psychological help that counseling that this woman had. She was really into shock and into trauma. They did not even apologize for what had happened. Um, they went back to business as, as usual. Um, and there was no evidence that maybe the kid died because of neglect, because uh, they did not attend to the child in time, or that the kid was just already uh, dead. But also, uh, like this cultural stereotyping of women uh, from uh, African has made it very difficult to communicate with the doctors. Their perception uh, of what is stress or what is trauma. For example, my clients go to the doctor, but because they do not look at you as an, an individual, they look into your file. Once Malika showed up and oh, she was once a victim of uh, human trafficking, she had post-traumatic stress and all that maybe, they do not really end up listening to what you're saying. So what happens is that um, you really miss being helped because you are just a, a, a file number, not really a person. And that's what people really, um, uh, there's no uh, mutual respect as a migrant woman, especially when you don't have really papers, when you're a patient. And then I see the changes. When you, uh, when you get your permit to stay, they quickly uh, call you up for so many tests that you were asking for, for the mm -hmm. last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So then you see this is a deliberate action that you do not access uh, healthcare because of uh, you're not documented. But we live in a, a, a Western world where they say, um, yeah, healthcare is for everyone. Like everyone is entitled to the right of health. Uh, it doesn't matter if you come from uh, uh, African uh, 
ethnicity or you're a migrant or you're a victim of human trafficking or you're a, a refugee. So it's still a, a big issue. But I think also what is makes it very big is that they do not speak out. We do not speak out a lot. What we do is that we meet in our migrant corners and we complain among ourselves. Can you believe this happened and this happened? Uh, we do not have platforms to share our views or our grievances about these cases. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, is what we really need is to find more platforms like this and more on community levels where migrant women have to share what is really happening so that it can be, move beyond a, 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 a sitting room to go mm -hmm. and meet the community uh, uh, stakeholders to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you are raising, both of you raise so many questions um, and everything is in the center of, of our network's work. But what you said, the last thing, Ma Malaika, uh, if I may rephrase it, I mean, you know, in, in Russian context, we would call it like sitting in the kitchen and having a kitchen conversation um, rather than um, taking some political action. Well, very often the kitchen conversation would lead to a political action. But the question, I guess, for us exactly is how do we move from those spaces where we, we, and those are important spaces for us um, to share those experiences, but how do we take it to the political level? And which brings me to the next question of Salome, who was running recently for political office. Uh, and uh, I know because we discussed a lot of your experiences, quite amazing experiences online, and the level of harassment and, and uh, name calling, and I do not know what other uh, epithets I could use for it, but we, we all witnessed it. And we know that this has not happened just at, the, at that period of time, that it was ongoing. And we also know, it, it, at least from my looking at those tweets and, and messages, it was very clear that there was a racial attack and there was also a sexist attack because they were also that they were attacking you as a black woman. And I want to speak about that, where we have this intersection between two discriminations and, and, and how we actually can bring this to light. Yeah, it's, it's actually very evident. The whole intersectionality of race and gender, it's, it's, it's very evident uh, for especially an African woman. And, um, you know, why we continue to face this is acknowledged. Again, I go back to the Durban Declaration in 2001 when the, the nations of the world met in uh, South Africa to discuss about issues of racism. And they actually uh, connected it to the whole issue of uh, colonization and slave trade. But apart from that, it has been actually reinforced by the st stereotype that we see in the media, what we read about Africa and read about African women, you know, being helpless, being uh, only good for bearing children, because that's how sometimes we come across uh, and having this many children, you know, people always complain about African women having many children and, and big families. But really the intersection of racism and gender is, is very, very, uh, prevalent, you know, and it it links to the hatred. It shows you about the hatred that people have, but uh, it's also misconceptions of what they've had and what they see as well and what they read, because people read a lot as well. And, you know, it, it's related to, to dark, so it's your color of your skin, you mm -hmm. know. In actually a previous um, the program that I had done, I had done an interview here in Ireland before, before they, they're going for the Senate. And uh, in that interview, I was actually calling the government to have the political will and commitment to address the whole issue of racism because mm -hmm. a man had been killed because of his color. And this actually goes with the words that goes when you are being named called or you are being fought, you know, whether it's racially, verbally, or if it's even physically, the words that goes with that, you know, they were very racist in nature. And so I ended up in the one of the national TV studio here in Ireland. It's actually the largest there at TE. And what these people did, they actually captured my video and everything, every word that I was saying, they ended up imitating it and, and putting it on how I want to cause genocide, you know, for the Irish people. But how the sexism and racism came into that was that this big African mama who doesn't look malnourished, that's what I was told. So for me, for them, they see people who are malnourished. They mm -hmm. should be people who actually 
uh, you know, coming to complain and doing all this. But you know, the, the, the whole word of fat was used. And I linked that, you know, with another incident we have here of one of the public representatives. Uh, he was a councillor actually not long ago who came into the public media to say that uh, he will not be representing Africans because they appear to be very aggressive and very loud. You know, that's how he put it. But if you look back into the whole story of uh, the black woman, woman and how she's actually perceived, look at Sarah Batman, you know, even they had to bring her statue with her butt. You know, her bomb was good. And actually the beauty of the African woman is her behind. If your African woman don't have a big behind, then you're not feeding her. You're not doing anything good to her. She's not a beautiful woman. A beautiful African woman is a, a woman who is actually, um, you know, beauty, you know, she's, she has, you know, she has her, uh, whatever you want to call it, yes. And mm -hmm. she has the bomb, she has all those things you would actually like to mention. And you can see it, those who have never heard the story of Sarah Bat they should, Batman, they should Google it and see. She was ended up actually being displayed. Uh, she was a slave she was, and they had used her quite a lot. I, I actually, I was in a taxi a um, few years ago in, in, uh, from, the, from Dublin in O'Connell Street and it was summertime. And this actually taxman told me that during summertime they get very excited because these African women put on short dresses and they are very excited to see, you know, this beautiful. I have never heard them say it's beautiful, but actually the man said that it's very beautiful. So they could just stand there and watch the African woman walking around. So it mm -hmm. actually shows you um, how, you know, the woman, the African woman is per perceived, you know, she's a, perceived as, a, you know, promiscuous. You know, right. talking, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've seen actually even in our work here in Ireland where African women are followed by men in cars, especially those women who are seeking international protection, being offered money to give in sex, you know. So what does that tell you? It tells you of so many things of how um, the people from the African continent continue to be haunted by this uh, experience of uh, colonization and the slave trade, where Africans were made to be seen as, you know, they are the inferior, we are the superior. So this that issue of the superiority complex well, we actually one, we are one less Africans and non-Africans, white people. We are all one less. We try to say this race and that race. There are no many races. It's actually one less, and then the ethnicities. You know, people coming from different ethnic groups. So it's a little major uh, problem and challenge for many African women. And as Marika is saying, you will find that even most of the women who are trafficked are African women. Actually, most of the trafficked here in Ireland are from Ireland. Uh, from sorry, uh, from um, Africa, uh, one mm -hmm. of the countries in Africa I won't mention. So it shows us that you know there's a problem and the perception of this cheap sex, you know, uh, cheap labor, cheap this and that, and you know, oh, they are beautiful, but you know, in the Western culture, you know, a slim woman is the perfect woman, size eight, the size six. You know, if you look at it from the African perspective, it's very different from that. But it's true here, you know, um, the way African women are treated and are seen uh, is, is very, very challenging. And it, it's challenging through the media because you see it through the media. You see it actually uh, in terms of maternity hospital where African women are blamed for going so many times to get babies, you know? Uh, because if people want children, if you want children, if you, you don't want it upon you. If I want and I can be able to manage it, why not? So there's uh, a lot of issues on, on perception, but also, you know, the mentality of the people and the attitude towards uh, what people actually seems to be the best for them. Uh, but also we have to be able to challenge this, um, um, the intersectionality of race and gender, and that you can only get support from the allies. And our allies are the women uh, from, you know, from Russia, from, you know, the, the rest of the world to be able to fight about this um, uh, kind of mentality and attitudes that are there towards women and black women in particular. Mm -hmm. Malaika, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, I think uh, sexism and racism are just uh, have the same root. That is hatred and supremacy. And um, we cannot separate the two. Um, what I see or what I've experienced and what I see around is that um, black women have been uh, termed or taken as uh, we are racially and biologically weak or inferior. And this has been paraded all over the media. This is what is showed about what we do as women, the single narrative of who we are that is showed by the media. Um, 
for example, we give uh, um, kids anyhow, we cannot um, we cannot really uh, m maintain the, the, the feminism as we, we claim it. But when this inferiority is thrown into the media, and this is what we see, it has got an uh, kind of uh, an attraction back to an energy that is replicated in also how women perceive themselves as weak people. But when it also comes to like the issue of human trafficking, this race and sexism is one of the major reasons why women do not even report. For example, 71% of uh, uh, the victims around the world are women. And just like you say, that in most countries, um, most of the uh, women, especially in the West, who are victims of human trafficking, uh, come from African uh, origin or from Eastern Europe. But because of this sexism and uh, the mentality, the stereotyping that these are weak people who uh, who are just looking for money. She's an African, so um, it's okay to be in prostitution. What I see is that also they lack uh, better representations when they report their cases. Mm -hmm. When you come from uh, an uh, um, African background, you really need to validate your existence as a victim. Um, as compared to someone who is uh, an indigenous uh, uh, person from uh, from Holland, this has made people become very reluctant to report the cases. But also, it has made trafficking more easy to target African uh, women because they know that they will not report the cases or they they, do not, they are not really helped uh, mm -hmm. uh, much. For me, I would think that. Um, in, we need to overcome this, but we need to get out of the kitchen, as you said. But we need to come up with the notion that nothing about us without us. We need to be able to come to the front line and explain this to, to, to the influencers of the law or the, 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 the stakeholders. Because if we are not part of the table, I realize that people make decisions for us. That really and we matter. are on the table usually. Being <laughs> yes, and we need to change that narrative. We need to go to the front and also change the table around to be served and share our views, uh, to be able to be heard and be seen. Recently, there's a case um, of my client. She, she's she was she's working in the sex industry, and she has been all the five children she has had. They've been taken away because there's this stereotype of that if you are a victim of human trafficking, there's a possibility that you cannot be uh, psychologically prepared to be a mother. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one by one, they took this woman's kids, like from the hospital, like they let her get all that pregnant, carried in nine months, then they take the kids. But what was really... Uh, uh, unfair is the way she was knocking at every door to be helped to be part of these children's lives. But because of this stereotyping that uh, she cannot be a mother because she's working in the sex industry or she was once uh, 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 an abuse or abusing drugs, she could not see the kids because the criteria that she had to meet to be that kind of mother, she didn't meet them. And this made this woman become more in relapsing mm. into drugs. Mm. Yet they were thinking that they are helping her, but they are just making things hard. There's also this sexism of uh, racism and of black women thinking that every black woman who goes with a white person is looking for papers or uh, looking for nationality. Mm -hmm. The experience from women, they are experiencing a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, violence in their home. But when they report these cases, um, mm. I've had a lot of testimonies that what comes to the uh, the officer's mind is that this girl wants an easy way out. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, if you get out of that man's home before you get your passport, the pa the, your partner has got a right to withdraw your permit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of fear of being deported, 
these women continue staying in abusive relationship. I had a friend who had to go to the police to report abuse of their husband. She had uh, bruises and stuff like that. And um, the, the husband was a, uh, a known member of uh, the society who went to the police also to give his case. And uh, the guy just said, well, I knew you only wanted papers from me. If you want papers, you wanted papers. Mm -hmm. You can just leave. do not uh, uh, spoil my credibility and my, uh, my identity to the police that I've done this to you. I didn't. So they believed the man and not, not her. Mm -hmm. And every statement the husband met against her as an African woman with, with that mentality that she only came into this relationship for papers, they withdrew the kids and they withdrew the permit and the woman uh, remained homeless. Mm -hmm. So this uh, mentality of uh, sexism and, uh, racism. and racism, it's mm -hmm. really so intertwined that you don't know where to put the boundary because it's it's just all um, immersed into one thing that is portrayed portrayed in the way uh, people are given services or how we are tended to. You've just mentioned that uh, uh, you're standing up as a black woman uh, speaking out uh, uh, your narrative about your political gender, and then you pointed out about how you look because we should be lo looking a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it's very uh, right, as she said, there's serious intersection between the two. And in order to work on these two, we really need to, to take them as twins. If it's racism, we can stand. We have zero tolerance, tolerance against racism uh, among African women or anybody. And also we are against sexism because, I mean, it's, uh, my stereotype is me and uh, what I sell to you is who I am. You can take it or leave it, but not to define me of the narrative you read about who is an African woman on, in literature or on TV. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, f for me personally, nothing, um, I mean, all these narratives and discourses and uh, all the nice uh, academic words, um, for me, everything comes to a reality, material reality of women. I mean, we can hear and read a lot of stories, but it's when we come in contact with women and we spend time with women and we work with them together when we really understand who the women are and really the massive differences between different ethnic groups. And yes, and Salome is absolutely right to point it out that, I mean, there is this whole perception that there is this woman of color or there is a black woman, but when you start communicating with women and you understand that there is there can be much more differences between some women coming from the same country but they come from different ethnic groups um, than those women who come maybe from two different continents um, but i wanted to to also ask you and it's already been almost one hour i really appreciate your time um, we have heard a lot of about discrimination and about racism and um, I know it's just a conversation but for us we think it's important to continue this conversation um, but there are equally important stories of women about which we do not hear again and we have a lot of those women in our network so we know of course uh, and we know what's happening in um, some of the Arab states and we know what's happening in some of the sub-Saharan Africa. There are certain countries where there are strong movements and the movements is led by women, or at least women are very active. And of course, women are also active in Europe. So, and we also have young women in our network who wanted to ask you um, about some positive stories or good examples, or apart from your own examples that uh, we can pass also to a younger generation, not necessarily only to African women, but any women. Yeah, I think, you know, like like my icon, you know, looking at Kenya, for example, we had Professor Wangari Madai, and she was so much uh, treated so badly by the government. And, um, uh, you know, she was actually fighting to, 
to um, to fighting for the environment. In particular, she believed in planting tree. That if you cut one tree, you plant ten more, three more, at least three more, but ten, uh, which was very good, you know. And it was her very deep belief. You know, Wangari could have spoken about uh, the issues we are talking about today, like racism, but she chose environment. So each and every one of us can do something, but it really have to be something that you are passionate about and something that you can keep you going because there's no need of starting something and then you stop at the middle of it and so there are so many women uh, in the last uh, few weeks for example i've been talking to a woman in kenya uh, there was conviction during this time of covid 19 of a group of people who live in one of the small slums it's called kariobangi it's not a slum as such but uh, these people had acquired blood 10 years ago they had built some uh, semi-permanent kind of uh, settlement but then they were actually, uh, you know, they were all demolished by the, by, by, by the police, they said. And this one woman actually came in front of everything. She was threatened quite a lot that she would be shut up if she doesn't shut up. And she continued to go and help those women, you know, to make their voice heard. She actually started the campaign through the media, through the Twitter, through Facebook. She got me through Facebook and actually I, I myself and another person here from Kenya, we tried to mobilize people to give money so that we can send them for food because they had left with nothing. So what I want to say is that there are so many good examples out there, but it takes the courage, you know, because it's not an easy job, especially when your life is going to be threatened. It, it has to be something that you're passionate about and that uh, you can carry along and that you're able to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, being able to have to have that confidence and to face those threats uh, to move on is very important. And also the, the, the compassion and the ability to bring others along because in my case, for example, um, when I was starting the network, I had to, to, to rise with the women and see what their problems were and then forming these small groups and the group becoming bigger. You know, we started, I started one, there we were seven of us, then there were 300, then now they are over 5,000. So that's how the movement actually normally work. But it's like you have to sell the vision uh, to other people and you have to bring other people along with you. So there are many good um, kind of, um, uh, you know, examples out there, but also just to say that each and every one of us can do something. You know, it's uh, depend on where you find your purpose and how you want to take that purpose uh, forward. I know we have young people like uh, our our Sodfa. You know, Sodfa is very good. If she see any injustice, she won't keep quiet. She will challenge it. And I've actually learned also quite a lot from her, you know, so it takes courage, but also you can look for other people to help you. Also, you know, the, looking at the whole issue of the mentor, because I know you are going to ask us, you know, the message that you want to give, that the mentors are very important and like a, uh, I've gone through mentoring myself and I've also mentored other people. So it's it's quite a, you know, a, a challenging journey, you know, being in a leadership role and taking actions on things, but you, you have to be able to influence and to be able to influence is actually being able to be co compassionate about what you are doing, having a very clear um, vision of also what you want to do and then bringing others along with you. I've also been able to lead campaigns, um, you know, looking for allies, uh, mm -hmm. you can also do that so that's my experience for now that i can say wonderful malika what about you yeah i agree uh, one of the points i want to mention is that um if you want to be uh, the leader of a movement or part of the movement you should be able to to bring others along with you but for me i think uh uh let me give this maybe for, for, for the minority migrant, is that you have to remain relevant and resourceful. Um, it's not very easy to navigate around, uh, uh, for example, in, in a country like Holland or other European countries where you cannot really move from here to there because there are a lot of obstacles. You need to be strategic. I had to realize that I had a passion for advocacy, and, but I'm not going to get there uh, because of my passion. I, I had to start from grassroots. How? I started volunteering uh, my service. I had a master's degree, but I just decided I needed to, to take a step down to work with this organization who are really near to my dream. 
-hmm. And what I did is that I never stopped dreaming. I was clear with what I wanted to be. And every time you met, you meet me, I just sell my dream. I was a seller of my dream. And I made sure even in my vulnerable position, I reminded myself who I am. At the time, I didn't have even the right to dream. Um, also, do not be afraid to dream under duress. There's a, a, I, I know there's a point in life um, because I was undocumented for 10 years, which means you don't have a right for everything, to, to everything. It gives you a blockage of looking at the future. But I held on to my dream, and this dream and selling my passion led me to a scholarship, being undocumented, but I managed to get from uh, uh, a diploma to a master's degree, but because I was selling my passion. But this was through uh, community involving, involving myself in community services and also volunteering. But also what I learned is that once you know who you are and who you are not, you focus on your lane. I had to take a, sp a step back to, to make sure that I can grow. Even though uh, everyone was going to school, I realized that, um, yeah, there's no shortcut to success. We live in, in, in a society where others have to take the elevator to success, and I had to take the stairway. And there's nothing as uh, full, uh, fulfilling as a pride as taking the stairway and earn your way up and you know you've earned it. So once you start speaking, you speak with authority, of course you've earned your journey. So we should not um, depend on others' validation to coexist, keep on dreaming, and also remember that knowledge that is not shared with others is not, it's not knowledge. If you have a platform and a stage, know when to stand down to give another person the light. Mm. I've learned that in, for me to be able to exercise my advocacy skills, someone had to give me part of her 15 minutes on a stage every time for the 10 years that I didn't have a right to go to school. Mm. After 10 years, I was a qualified um, advocacy, advocate person because I was on the stage. So mm -hmm. we need to learn to share the stage, our stage with others. With this mentorship, we need to be welcoming and evolving. Um, also, uh, we cannot do this movement in, um, yeah, uh, in darkness in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. We need to come out and share our views. You look for the stage where you can be heard. I had this quote that made me realize that, okay, if I need to sell my view, I need to look for the right platform. There's a saying in Uganda, or uh, some may might relate that um, once you have an idea, and uh, an idea is like a drop of water. Once it drops in the sea, it's just like part of the sea. We need to find our niche. Where can we drop our ideas so that to be seen? So I realized that I needed to contact uh, like Anna, because uh, she's inclusive, or it's a, an organization that gives a stage to women. You need to be strategic to find organization who will see you and hear you and also push you uh, forward. Mm. Well, um, I just remember our first conversation on the phone. And honestly, I, I am still quite stunned and humbled and we won't go into the details, but I think you're speaking about passion and dream and selling your dream. I, for me, it's not just selling your dream. I mean, hearing the story, what, when you say you lived 10 years undocumented, I do not think that many people in this world actually understand what it means to have an undocumented status when you literally does not exist as a citizen, when you do not exist on paper, when you cannot cross borders, when you cannot go to education or, or health. It's it's not something that people think about unless they're actually confronted by the situation. We have relatives like this or we end up ourselves in the situation as migrants. And I I cannot say enough how much I commend the, 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 the courage and the persistence and the sheer faith what you said actually to me. And I thought that this is 
is something it's a very rare quality i think it's very easy to lose this whatever we call faith i am personally a secular person and not a lot in our network <laughs> women who have a real faith but the point is um it is something that you know when everything is gone what what, what do you look at what what where is your hope um as a as a human being and i, I think it's it's not easy to preserve this through such difficult circumstances yeah and I'm very grateful for both of you being um, here today. We have some comments, some inspiring women from our other members. But really, honestly, thank you. And thank you for having this conversation. I know that we could have spoken for hours about discrimination against um, Black women, against African women, against migrant women. The conversation hasn't finished. We do take this very seriously, not only because uh, these are the women who are in our network, but also because the conversation is ongoing. It's part of the discussion. There is movement and there are riots. And we want to bring our own perspective in this. And this perspective, it comes from the women's human rights. And uh, we will continue this discussion. And thank you again very much for being here. Unless you want to add something, some last thing that you want to say. Um, myself, you know, it's just, you know, to give advice uh, following on what Marika have said, because you see, uh, Marika, you know, she's she's very good actually in the network and she's still qualified for the young people, you know, we, we are growing old within the movement and within the network. So just, uh, just to give, you know, a word of advice is that whatever you plan to do or whatever you put down to do, please do not compromise. I know I, I have I have a very strong stand on things that I don't compromise because everything has to be based on what you believe in and you are actually values and principles at the same time. So that's just really my final word. Don't compromise with whatever you do uh, or whatever you believe in to, 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 you know, to, to fit in somebody else. Thank you. Malika, do you want to have your last word? And this is to, uh, if you are a survivor of domestic violence, or a survivor of human trafficking, everyone is a survivor of something. I want you to remember that um, you are more than your personal experience. Mm. With patience and faith and resilience, you can rise above those uh, traumatic experience and reclaim your student dreams. Mm. 15 years down the road, um, that will be a story for another time. Mm. But I think I always say, um, someone once told me, yeah, not everyone can do what you did. I disagree. We just need to believe and start somewhere and support each other. So if you are there struggling with identity of your dream or uh, your uh, confidence was taken away with uh, uh, stripping your human rights or with abuse, God all made us for each one of us have a purpose here. And we just need to think within ourselves and reclaim that one. Because an abuser, an abused man, or a bad loss, or a, a trafficker, or whatever that you've encountered, is just a circumstance. We are all children of, of, of this world, are like she said, we are all citizens of this world. We're entitled to the same rights, entitled to the same dreams. It might take a little bit longer, but do not settle for less. I always say it, I'm more than my personal experience. I am not a victim of human trafficking anymore. I'm more than a survivor. I am a mother. And you can't be anybody. So sometimes when you're struggling, finding who you are, I always say, Think within yourself, what can describe you as a person beyond your traumatic experience? When you find that person, that is the beginning point to reclaim yourself. Well, that's a very good ending, I think. I'm also going to feel for a while like a mother. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's all, all, the, all your points are well taken. And I hope that... Um, uh, the interview will be finished, but uh, it will stay on our timeline and uh, people will be able to see it. Thank you so much once again and um, have a very good evening. Thank you. And you Thanks, guys. Mama. Thanks, Marika. Bye.